Good evening. You have me again for those return offenders. Uh, I'm the speaker again this year, but I uh, want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Hopefully you're here for Storm Spotter training class, although we probably could work on sandbagging um, <laughs> in preparation for this spring. Uh, for those of you I don't know, my name is Todd Shea. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the La Crosse National Weather Service. And what we're going to uh, present here again is our 2019 version of our Storm Spotter training. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and some new people, so again, appreciate you coming out on a Tuesday evening. We're a little bit earlier than we normally are on the calendar for La Crosse County, but um, with the government furlough and the way that we could get a room here at Mayo, we had to find a date that worked, and this was the date, so I'm glad it worked out. Last year, I think we had to reschedule and moved it way late April, so um, we don't have any flooding yet, and we don't have any uh, falling snow at the moment, so we're kind of in between. Uh, the whole session tonight should last about two hours. We will take a break in the middle. I don't have any cookies to, to give you like we used to give, but uh, we'll take a break and give everyone a little chance to relax. I did do this presentation last week, and uh, it, it finished just under two hours, so I'll try to keep on that same uh, rhythm and pattern here. Last week, I was out at a community in, uh, in Minnesota where it was zero degrees and 30 inches of snow on the ground, so uh, tonight we don't have the 30 inches here, you know, but quite a bit, and we a lot warmer than zero, so we're working our way up, I guess, but we got the rain to deal with. Uh, before I move on, I just wanted to introduce a few people uh, in the back of the room. I have two of our newer meteorologists, uh, Molly Offworth on the right and Nicole Batsek on the left are two of our meteorologists that are um, probably will be out giving talks next year if they're not promoted and moved on already, but uh, they're just kind of here to answer any questions that you might have at the break. Uh, or, you know, uh, be here for support. So thank them for, for a long day to come out here. And my, my wife is also, a, uh, my biggest critic is in the back. She's going to give me critiquing notes. So um, before I go on to, I just a few things to kind of bookkeeping here. And I'm going to make sure I don't miss my notes. Um, I do have, we don't have a lot of handouts. There is some stuff from amateur radio friends that I'll talk about in a little bit in the back. And also some preparation stuff. Uh, via Keith Butler from La Crosse County Emergency Management and myself, uh, knowing that that might be our biggest threat so far in the spring. Uh, but um, I will have some other handouts as we go through. I'll, you can pick up at the break or afterwards tonight. One of the handouts that you, a lot of you have already is this yellow sheet. Like in previous years, it has all of our contact information, any web address or web app or you know phone app that I had mentioned tonight, all that's on here, along with a lot of other uh, background information. Uh, I will have out two at the break uh, in the back there most likely. We, if you would like to become an individual contact for us tonight and, and kind of be in our list, uh, especially if you live kind of out in rural areas or around the county, uh, we have a, a special severe weather contact form where you'd fill out and then we would add you to our database. You never know when um, you might get a call from us if it's something specific in your area. And then um, I also wanted to ask, is there any Minnesota law enforcement here tonight? Okay, because we give, they get some training credits, and I have that in case. I didn't know if there'd be anyone from Houston County over here. Uh, well, let me just ask, is there anyone from the Minnesota side here tonight? Okay, okay. And then um, I know a lot of you from La Crosse County. How about neighboring counties, Monroe County? Rude. Okay. Trumpelow. Trumpelow, okay. Proper. All right. So we got a nice mix around the area. Anyone from Northeast Iowa? Just checking. All right. Excellent. All right. Um, the only other thing I have to kind of mention here is Alan, right here with La Crosse Technology, has been nice enough to donate a, uh, a no weather radio. This is a model that I guess we helped them develop years ago. But uh, it is just a kind of a basic handheld no weather radio. But the nice feature is if you only want tornado warnings alerted on it, they made where you can just push one button and that's all it will monitor. So anyway, we're gonna give this away as a door prize tonight. Um, Molly and Nicole are gonna work out a system based on if you signed in or not. And then what we'll do at the end is we'll have someone randomly pick a number and whatever number is on the list uh, for that, they, they can take this home with them if they like. So. All right, I think that's everything. We'll go ahead and dive into the material here. Uh, so can I go ahead and get started here? Trying to stand away. Okay. 
This was going to be my lead-in this year after what happened last year with the record flooding, especially in the southwest Wisconsin. A lot of communities had extensive flooding, but after the way this winter is going, I changed the wording to winter. So, you know, we don't control the weather in the weather service, and uh, so I apologize the, uh, the way it's been the last six weeks or so, but by the way, we're sick of it too and ready to move on. In fact, the winter weather kind of has been really impacting us in a sense of we need to get going on our spring training and, and to, you know, getting people enthused for uh, severe weather season and things like that, and the winter storms just kind of keep going in. In the last 24 hours, uh, I know our office has been concerned with the flooding coming up, but things really changed in the last 24 hours with this rain coming in now and warmer temperatures and the river forecasts, especially just south of here, are going to spike up later this week. And so we're kind of now we're in a to flooding talk here, at least for a few days, and then hopefully it'll quiet back down in a while. But, you know, we have severe weather every year. It, lately, it's been the flooding and such, but we, uh, you know, occasionally get our tornado activity, uh, hail, windstorms, you name it. So, you know, there's always something that we need spotters out there for. There's always some threat that we have to deal with. So, as a spotter, refresher for some of you, new material for uh, some of you in the room, what we're asking you to do, of course, is to observe the weather. Not just the day-to-day -day quiet weather, but when there is bad weather around, we'd like to know about that, communicate it. We're going to talk about some safety things as we go through. We you know, want to put you in harm's way by any chance. Um, your information helps out local officials. Key dispatch centers, my, myself, you know, or our office, I should say, getting the warnings out in a timely fashion. And You know, I, I could have started the whole presentation tonight. Do you realize that your information could potentially save lives? You know, let's, let's hope we never get that type of higher-end event, but someday it will, and we've already had tornado outbreaks in the south, in Alabama and Georgia, and they've had, I think, was it 23 fatalities, more than all of last year combined, and, you know, spotters play a big role in trying to get the word out. So again, you know, you talk about these higher end events, you know, we had a tornado come through La Crosse in 2011, uh, but if we ever had a, a bigger event or a, a weather episode, the spotter information will and has proven very useful. You may not realize it too, but the spotter reports go into the warnings that you hear, whether you get them on your phone or on television or radio stations. You know, we'll talk about tonight how we use our radar and we use the meteorology of it and stuff, but any background information we can get, any ground truth information, a lot of times may prompt a warning or goes into those decisions that you hear on the, the news or the sirens go off. You know, it's, it's not just always National Weather Service and radar, it's what's also happening in the communities. And with that said, too, a lot of the social scientists, and, and I've talked about this for years, in, in their research have, have seen that seeing a tornado on TV or having the sirens go off or anything like that, if you talk to any of the dispatchers at a county level and they, they turn on the sirens in a community, the first thing that happens is people call them. They went, why are the sirens going off? You know, do I really need to take shelter and stuff? It's, it's because people look for ground confirmation themselves. Everyone self, you know, assesses their risks. I don't even know how many of you go take shelter immediately when there's a tornado warning out, but you might seek out additional information. Go to television or you know whatever you use to to find out what's going on there. So, if we can add that ground truth report, that real time information that. A tornado has been spotted in Hoka or Caledonia or, you know, it's headed this way or, you know, in the path of you or sometimes these days it's getting a, a piece of information on Facebook from one of your peers, one of your family members or anything like that. Uh, that all goes into the confirmation. So that's, that's one of the important reasons behind storm spotters. I heard a new analogy recently where it's like a, a bouquet of roses. So if you take each flower and you say that's a source of weather information. Is it better to just have one flower or one source or is it best to get a bouquet and get you know all those um, different sources out there to kind of reconfirm the threat and get people to motivate, I guess you could say. So that's the importance of why we do this. And again, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. Now, if you're not familiar with us, National Weather Service, this is what we're not about. I changed some of the screens from past years. You know, the Sharknado movies, they've gone they jumped the shark, right? They've done all kinds of different things. I even found a video game uh, when I was preparing slides for this year with a Fortnite 
sec section of a video game where they fly the people into tornadoes and chase tornadoes in and stuff. So, um, you know, it is what it is, but that's not what we're about. We don't hype the weather, although some people think we do, but it's more about telling people what the potential is. You know, to be honest, we talk about spring flooding here and how high is the Mississippi going to get, things like that. We really don't know at this point. There's too many variables. That's just the way it is. But it's not out of the question that we should prepare. You know, we should be preparing for, for high water, just in case, because of all the parameters are in place for that. It might, we have a way to escape it without major flooding, but we just don't know that yet. So what the Weather Service is really about, another way to look at it is we are, we work with our local communities, uh, you all, emergency management, the media, everyone together, we're trying to make communities more resilient, more prepared, you know, for these times of active weather. So what we call a weather ready nation. Um, it may never be perfect, but trying to get people more and more ready, more weather savvy, if you will. We're always trying new things, I guess you could say. If you're not familiar with where we're located, we're up on the ridge tops. You might have seen the big, or you know where we're at with the white ball or the radar. Um, I think the thing to take out of this is we do operate 24 hours a day. So we always have at least two people there, sometimes three, and during busy weather we will bring in extra bodies or hold people over uh, depending on how busy the weather is going to get. Our service area, we of course encompass, I think, everyone that's in the room here. Uh, Houston County, La Crosse County, Monroe County, Crawford, Vernon, Trempolo, uh, but uh, western Wisconsin, southeast Minnesota, and northeast Iowa. 28 counties, three different states, so it gets kind of interesting in my job working with uh, 28 county flavors with 20 th or three state governments and all the different rules, but um, it's also a challenge sometimes for our staff, but we try to kind of meet all the needs for these areas. So for most of you in the room here, as weather moves in, we're, our office is already kind of working the weather or getting reports from our own area. So I, I think it goes pretty smooth. There are, of course, weather offices around our area that have responsibility, and so we will monitor what kind of information they're getting and try to make that flow into the different service areas as smooth as possible. Same thing with the uh, river levels, you know, what's happening up here in the Twin Cities. Uh, we obviously track to see what's coming down our way here. And before I forget too, this is uh, only our second talk for the season, so if you know of anyone else that's you know, uh, interested in storm spotter training, we do have talks in a variety of locations yet this spring. Uh, we have a full schedule on our website, uh, March and April. So. All right, I mentioned um, you know, all the different pieces of information that we're looking for. Of course, one of them is our radar uh, that's been here in La Crosse since 90, early 96. And the, the radar has continued to get enhancements. Some things we know for sure, like location, intensity of the storm, the movement, that sort of thing. Uh, rain versus hail, we've gotten more information there. And there are some things that we can only estimate. We can tell that there's really gusty winds, maybe at 1,000 feet up or 3,000 feet up, but what is actually happening in your community or on the ground? Same thing with hail size and, and rain estimations. If there's a lot of hail falling with rain, for example, the radar tends to overestimate how much actual rain fell in someone's gauge. And so it's always good to get confirmations there, too. Uh, in recent years, I used to say that the tornadoes, or I should say radars, can't detect tornadoes at all. We can see rotation. Uh, but there has been a little bit of enhancement with the radars that we can actually see tornado debris sometimes if the, if the tornado has hit something, but that's kind of after the fact. So we are kind of moving into a stage where we can literally say radar confirmed tornado, uh, but it, it's nothing like getting confirmation from <laughs> eyes, from you know spotters out there. That's the best case scenario is to get everyone kind of working together. Um, so radar is there, but it has its limitations. All right, look, for a, a show of hands, how many of you have never been to a spotter training class before? All right, again, awesome. Thanks for coming out, at least half the room or so. So especially for the new people here tonight, just a few uh, heads up, and then we'll dive into it here. Um, I do cover a lot of information very quickly. Again, I try to keep it under two hours, but it seems like every year we've got more to push in the package. Uh, each storm, each year is a little different. So uh, we'll show you some examples, a lot of examples of different cloud types and things. It may not look exactly like that when you get out there. Uh, a lot of our storms that we get here in western Wisconsin are, are tough to kind of 
decipher and figure out. So uh, it takes some experience. You know, maybe start watching the skies and then you come back next year or the year after. You know, every couple of years or so is a good idea and it really might start falling into place. Uh, we don't want people to exaggerate, of course. It leads to false alarms. Sometimes that's inevitable, but we'd rather you be on the conservative side uh, of what you're kind of reporting and see. And again, we're going to get into some safety tips as we go through because we really don't want people, you know, we're trying to save life and property and not get people injured. We don't want people uh, getting hurt by any means doing this. All right, so this kind of uh, is the outline for tonight and the outline for storm spotting. Uh, there's, of course, a training element and for, for what we're doing tonight. But we start with kind of the preparing or knowing if there's going to be severe weather on a day. We'll talk about when we go out and actually storm spot, the actual act of it, the observing, which is the fun part for people, right? You get to see the clouds and stuff. Uh, we'll spend the most time on that. And then we also, of course, have to talk about communication because it, it doesn't do anything good if you see something and don't report it or if we, you know, if we see rotation on radar and don't put a warning out and so on. So communication is, is a big part of that too. All right, so let's, let's dive in and talk about preparing then. We're going to start with this little video here. I just want you to see if you notice I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buffering his lordship's scone below stairs, sir. But I was wanting my peculiar in the poppy chair. Constable, arrest, Lady Smythe. <laughs> How did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not grant the juniors. It's just a matter of observation. All right, I was just curious, how much of you noticed how things changed in the background and changed with what they were holding and things like that? <laughs> Here's kind of the big picture of that Clearly, somebody skit. in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts Precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buffering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was wanting my peculiars in the poppy chair. Constable, arrest, Lady Smythe. All right, so it may not be a perfect analogy, but the idea there is if I had told you, okay, look for you know specific changes, background. Uh, look to see what they're holding. You might not, you probably would have noticed that. Uh, and it's, it's kind of the analogy of going into a severe weather day. If you did not know there was a risk of severe weather, let's say, uh, weather might start developing or you might not be prepared or, you know, it might start being some funnel clouds and, well, you didn't know that that was there, you wouldn't be thinking about looking for it. But if, if we know that there's a risk out there, we're informed, then you, you know, plan out your day if you're going to do this and, and look for things that might be occurring. So. The first thing we'll say with preparing is find a good source of weather information. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be the National Weather Service, although I'm going to talk about our material here in a second, but a favorite television station, radio, uh, an app, you know, a website, whatever you use that you can trust and you've found good um, you know, weather radio, things like that, anything that you find works good for you, uh, use that. But take advantage of it. There's so much information out there these days, you can you know, look at how much when we started doing these, uh, you know, I've been in the lacrosse since 1995 when I first started meeting with the, the Riverland Amateur Radio Club and some of the amateur radio uh, groups in the area. We would, you never, we never had cell phones, you, you had to turn on TV and things like that. Now we can look at stuff so much easier, so take advantage of that information. You can sign up with a lot of the, the local media and, and get alerts for warnings and things like that. There's all kinds of ways to stay informed. Now, of course, I'm going to give our website a plug in. If you go to weather.gov, that's our agency's website, but weather.gov slash lacrosse will get you to our front page. A lot of information on there on you know, current weather, past weather, uh, spotter activation, radar imagery, uh, you name it, is all on there. So, and, and here's an example of a screen capture from our website during active weather. Because there is a lot of information on there, there's a few things that I would kind of point you to is you can check up on top and see if there is a news headline. 
For example, tonight we have a news headline about the possible flooding the next few days. Not necessarily on the Mississippi River, but some of the smaller rivers and things like that. Um, there, the, web, the map itself, excuse me, will highlight or color in any watches, warnings, things like that. And that information is on there. So if you were to go there right now, you would see that we've got a flood watch out for the entire state of Wisconsin, actually. Most of Minnesota and Iowa are all on flood watches. And some of our rivers are also have flood warnings out. And then we make special graphics that you can view, the radar loop, uh, you name it. There's all kinds of information on there. So um, you know, if you're looking for a source, uh, that's out there. And it, it's very dynamic. We change it for the current weather going on. We're also on social media. Maybe not the newer stuff for the younger generation, but uh, the original social media, I guess, the Facebooks. Uh, we have a Twitter account. If you're not familiar with Twitter, it's kind of like a news feed. It, uh, it just kind of sends little updates that we put out there. We also cut YouTube videos for active weather. So if you followed us all, you know we did a lot of winter briefings this year. The spring flood outlooks, we cut some YouTube videos and uh, bigger thunderstorm outbreaks uh, where we have information out there. So. Again, other ways to take uh, advantage of the information. Uh, weather radio, we talked a little bit about for possible door prize tonight, but we have really good weather radio coverage now. Uh, not complete, but in most areas. So a lot of transmitters around the state of Wisconsin and then the uh, Minnesota side too. Pretty good coverage out there. So, All right, let's get into some of the, what we call headlines, but the different types of information that we put out at the National Weather Service. Uh, it actually starts with the Outlook stage, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, refresher training for some of you in the room. Uh, but you also get the familiar watches and warnings. So a watch, which kind of jumped to the middle of the end here, watch means there's a potential for that type of severe weather to, to impact the area. So right now we're under a flood watch, and I hope we're not under flood watches from now to May 1st. I think there'll be several of them. But because of the shot of rain coming in the next couple of days, we've got a flood watch. It means there's a potential for flooding to develop. Uh, a typical tornado watch in the summertime might only be, you know, a total of six to seven hours on a given evening, something like that. But the, this type of flooding watches or winter storm watches tend to go a little longer. Warnings, on the other hand, though, are the local level parts of a county, sometimes the entire county. And that means that Someone has reported severe weather or it looks severe on radar or, you know, whatever it is. If it's a blizzard warning, then we expect that type of uh, high-end winter event. So warning is kind of the action stage. We want the public to take action. Covering a smaller area, usually a shorter time frame. So watches and warnings, it's kind of this layered approach that we do. Uh, but you'll notice that outer layer, there's actually the step ahead of, of the warnings out there called outlooks. So we'll get back to that in a second. Now, some people say, well, you guys are always throwing out tornado warnings and stuff. How do I know if it's for real? I went back to 2010 through last year, and this is the total number of warnings that our office has issued in our, just our service area. And you can see severe thunderstorm warnings for things like large hail, damaging wind, uh, quite often. You know, a county might experience it anyway from 10 to 25 times over a season, depending on how it goes. Flash flood and tornado numbers are, are certainly lower. Tornado numbers especially. We really don't issue tornado warnings as often as you might think. Some counties that might go on for, for years without ever getting into a tornado warning. So um, just kind of comparison uh, for warnings out there. Another new graphic that I have just to show you last year where the different severe thunderstorm warnings were put out. So if you happen to live in, uh, what is that, like Cashton, uh, Southwest Monroe, you never had any warnings for your area, at least severe thunderstorm warnings last year. So almost everyone gets a severe thunderstorm warning at some point. Um, this is the tornado warnings. So you can see much smaller geographic areas. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can go years without ever having a tornado warning out. And then there are some years where it's two or three in a row, it seems like. But, so severe thunderstorm warnings, uh, quite, quite a bit compared to the other type of warnings. And by the way, the warnings that get pushed over to a lot of cell phones these days, and that's called the wireless emergency alerts, uh, one of the reasons why we only push over tornado and flash flood warnings is for that exact reason. If we were to push over every severe thunderstorm warning, it would just be too muddled in the water. So those higher end warnings, uh, typically a little bit more high end fatality producers are reserved for that uh, service that the cell phone companies and the FCC do to push stuff across. So. All right, let's get back to the outlooks. 
And these outlooks come in graphical or written forms. I, I don't think I mentioned that. Let's look at the graphical versions first. This, these are kind of nice to just see the risk area. Uh, they're made to cover kind of the lower 48 states, and they, they do this all the time for today, tomorrow, and the next day out, or day one, day two, and day three. Uh, for more of your weather interest in the room, you can actually on our websites look at the days four through eight, but you have to realize that uh, to predict a severe weather outbreak that many days out, pretty rare that you would ever see an outlook that far out. But some of the bigger ones um, they do. But we're going to mainly focus on day one, day two, day three here. So the different risk areas that you'll see shaded on there are kind of covered in this graphic. Uh, I also think of it as kind of a scale from one to five. One and two, marginal and slight. That's the most common. You know, several times a severe weather season we'll get into those lower end risk levels. Maybe a shot for a little bit of severe weather, not expected to become too widespread, too high end, uh, but there's going to be some around. Uh, it's these higher levels that are a little more rare uh, that we really need to be, you know, prepped for when it does occur, and the risk of more dangerous, uh, life-threatening weather could occur in that. So levels three, four, five, enhanced, moderate, or high risks. I would say the enhanced risks, and this changed about two or three years ago if you're um, you weren't used to seeing this many levels. They kind of added more levels uh, a couple years ago. But the enhanced risk we might get into here in this part of the state, I don't know, two or three, four times a year. And most of the time we do have some weather during it. may not always hit your area, but uh, we'll have weather in the region. The moderate risks may be only once every couple years. And the high risks are pretty rare. I can remember the last high risk we were in. That was 2007 in Wisconsin here. It's been that long. So it's not that I'm a date freak or anything like the guy in WIZM, right? Brad Williams or something, but Mr. Jeopardy. But no, I, I just remember that that was the last time we had that because they're so rare. So uh, so that's the different levels. Hopefully you kind of get the feel of it. One and two kind of lower risks and three, four, five are the higher risks. Let me show you some examples. These are actual examples going back a few years. May 17th, 2017. We were in kind of the north end of one of these level threes or enhanced. You can see the orange area. And then this is all the severe weather that occurred. The different colored dots represent hail, wind, or tornado activity in the region. July 19th, 2017, you start getting the idea here. Another expected to be busy day. And sure enough, we had weather around our area. Going to last year, June 9th, 2018. And another thing. Sometimes these updates change during the day. Maybe in the morning it didn't look like severe weather was that likely, and then as things kind of evolved during the day, I mean, we try to do what we can to, to message that to our spotters and things like that, but this was a case where it started off, we were in a uh, level one, a marginal risk, and then one of the updates came in and added a level two or slight risk, and then by the afternoon they actually had bumped it up to a level three, and this was the severe weather. And you can see it didn't really hit lacrosse, maybe parts of Houston County, but there was tornado activity down more southwest of us here. A couple more examples. Just to, uh, here we are kind of in a slight risk, and you can see the sporadic reports. And last year, uh, in kind of a late end of the season, they had this risk on September 20th, which turned out to be a very busy tornado day off to our northwest, up towards Red Wing, and into northwest Wisconsin, and way out in southwest Minnesota. So, yeah, the cross was in a level three, but it didn't occur here. Sometimes that's the way it pans out, but we typically do get weather when there is those risks out. So it's kind of rare to get a surprise storm without any kind of risk uh, in effect. So that's the graphical outlooks. I also mentioned there's a written version called the Hazardous Weather Outlook, uh, and that is, is typed up by our staff, by our meteorologists. And, and it's more local because it's meant to provide you with what we expect to occur here locally, timing, what types of severe weather we might expect. Is it going to be a true tornado day or is it only going to be a wind threat? That sort of thing. Uh, try to kind of give you what the storm mode is, if you will, you know, what type of storms that we can expect. That actually goes out to seven days, uh, even in the wintertime. We'll talk about winter storms and things like that. So if you're not familiar with these, you can actually, uh, I'll show you where you can find all this stuff on our websites. Uh, we do broadcast it over our weather radio transmitters around the top and bottom of each hour, not conse uh, con consecutively or all the time there. 
We also provide an uh, email service for this. And we started this a long time ago, so we have a lot of people signed up. But if you would like to get, every time we update this, if you'd like to get it pushed to your email, one of the sign-ups you can do tonight, I'll have a clipboard up here at the break. You can leave me your email address and sign the Outlooks box. I will add you to our hazardous weather outlooks uh, as quick as I can. And then you will get an email each day from us if the system's working, sometimes multiple times a day if we update it. So we've had people that sign up and then we get back into the winter time and they ask to take off the list because they don't want to hear about all the winter storms and stuff. My email address is on the bottom of each one, so you can just let me know and I will um, take you off the list as soon as I can. It, it seems like inadvert or all the time though I get home on a Friday afternoon, I, um, I'm off for that weekend, I check my email and someone sent me a, an email about 2 o'clock on Friday, can you take me off this list? And then I might not be back in until Monday, so uh, sometimes it takes a few days, but we do try to keep up with that. We don't send anything out or spam anyone, it's all what you sign up for. So where do you see this Outlook information? On our websites, if you go right above the map, one of the, the links or selections here is Current Hazards. And if you mouse over the word Outlooks, this is the page, or if you click on it, I should say, this is the page that will come up. And it has a, a direct link to our local written directions or Outlook guidance, if you will, and then that day one, day two, and day three. Um, so I, I, I looked before I left tonight, you know, the, this, you can actually see, because of this big storm that we're getting rain from tonight, it's actually bringing a severe weather risk to our south. So you can actually see how it looks like across the country. It's all hopefully stay to our south, but um, day one, day two, and three are available on there. So. so that's where you can go find that yourself if you want. All right, so that's kind of some of the preparedness stuff. Last year we also started something else that you might see on our front web page. We do email this out to... Uh, emergency management officials and some of our, uh, what we call partners that we work with, uh, a lot of one-to-one -one on. But on our website, sometimes in the upper right corner now, near the news link, you'll see uh, something called a situation report. Uh, it's, it's a document that is anywhere from three to six pages or so. It has some of the specifics. I think we have one up there tonight. It talks about the flood risk and stuff. So that's another way, if we go into a busy thunderstorm day, you'll oftentimes see that up there. One thing we'll do, though, is once we get into the severe weather, you know, the warnings are flying out and stuff, we might end up removing that, this thing from our website, because we don't want old information to sit there as the event is actually happening. So but you might see that up on our web page called the Situation Report. All right, so that's a lot of the preparing ideas. Let's get into the actual, when do we need spotters out there? And again, this is not always a perfect system of... Uh, exactly let's go kind of thing. For example, if we have a watch out, let's say there's a severe thunderstorm watch or a tornado watch out, uh, it's been out a little bit or it comes out, do we need spotters to instantly go out and get in position or you go outside and start watching the skies right away? The problem there is it, probably not because a lot of times the storms might be hours out, they might not even quite, the imp or quite impact your part of your county uh, that's maybe a time to, of course, check. If we do have a, a tornado watch out, it's a good idea to keep closer tabs on the weather for when you might be needed because it's, we are expecting uh, at least a threat in the area. Uh, if you're mobile, uh, if you're the mobile folks in the room, amateur radio, fire departments, law enforcement, you know, is there communication equipment working? Are you ready to go? That sort of thing. But for the most part, it's just keeping tabs on the weather. Um, the watch television, Keep an eye on that technology. We talk about whatever, whatever works there. On the other hand, now, if you wait for a warning to come out for your community, is, is that the time that we need spotters out there? Nope. Well, kind of like the opposite, too soon, this would be probably too late. You wouldn't have time to get in position if you are going to go out and kind of keep an eye on the skies for us. Uh, in some cases, you might actually have to take shelter if it's rearing down on you. Um, and also, you know, be careful if the storms are coming in. They, they could change paths. And, and things like that. Uh, but that's oftentimes too late, and we're, we're even assuming that the warning came out in a timely fashion. Uh, as, as some of you may know, you know, we're not, believe it or not, we're not perfect. Believe it or not, sometimes the event happens and we don't even have a warning out, but you know, we try to get that warning out with some lead time that's out there. So ideally, we're kind of shooting for something in between. And this is where that gray area comes in a little bit. We need people to have enough time to be prepared to 
get in their position if they're going to be mobile uh, out ahead of the storm so they can be ready to go. So it takes a little bit of proactiveness and, again, weather monitoring, if you will. Looking to see, are we under a watch? Or how far out are those storms? Are there warnings out on those storms? They all kind of play into this mix. So in these couple cases, the one on the left, you've got a, if you're looking at radar, there's a line of, uh, you know, bright colors, but the line of uh, storms coming in, we would kind of expect our communities out ahead of it to, to ready themselves or, or get the spotters out. And then the shot on the right, which happens to be a screen capture from May 22nd, 2011. And we'll talk more about that, the tornado event here in the, in the area in the second half. But, you know, you got storms like that coming at us, and we've got a tornado watch out. We would expect, you know, again, spotter groups out ahead of that to ready themselves and, and to get in position there. So a few things, and there are a lot more kind of guidance ideas on that yellow sheet that you might already have. But, you know, stay ahead of the weather, monitor conditions. Uh, there's going to be some false alarms in a sense that we might ask spotter groups to go out, or maybe your county does, or depending on where you're from. And, and then the storms move and, and miss your area, which is, of course, the best. But you might go out on storm watch, and then nothing really materializes. And that's sometimes that's kind of the way it works. Uh, it's better to be proactive, though. You know, there are some of our communities that are very proactive. They'll come to us, and they'll say, hey, should we get people out there? And, I have to admit, there's a lot of times where I'd say, you know what, I don't know, this storm's kind of look wishy-washy, I would, or marginal, I would maybe sit tight a little bit, and they go ahead and send a few people out, and sure enough, severe weather occurs, so it, it doesn't hurt to be proactive in that sense, so. There is some guidance out there, those outlooks we talked about, what kind of outlook level are we in, does that hazardous weather outlook say that spiders will be needed, is, is it all matching? And then we also have another thing that's unique for our office called the spotter activation notification. Now we started this back in 2008. I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, but what this is, it's not meant to replace anything that is done at, let's say, your particular county level. Uh, some of the counties, they'll activate spotter groups or the amateur radio clubs. You might alert yourselves, okay, it's, we're going to send some people out. But you, you can do, continue to do that. That all works great. But we always had people that are like, well, how do I know if uh, I'm here from the general public, how do I know if I'm going to be needed and uh, I should go out? So we have this system here where you can sign up tonight if you'd like. Again, on the same sign-in sheet, uh, you, you can leave me your cell phone number and, and company that's through, like U.S. Cellular Verizon. Or you can give me your email address again and type the activation box. And we yeah, it goes into our database. And, for example, you will get a, a text if we recommended activation in your county that says spotter activation recommended. And sometimes it'll have a little detail like north end of county or south end of county, something like that, that can kind of help you. Um, so that, that's another service that you can sign up for. If you're already on it, if you got activations last year, you do not need to sign up again. If you're not sure, go ahead and sign up again. But uh, we keep and just keep building on the list every year or so. Now on the internet, you can, we do have this website. It's on that yellow sheet that you have in front of you. Uh, well, you can also just monitor to see if your county is uh, recommended for spotter activation. So what will happen here is if you go to it tonight, for example, it's all green. There's, you know, the weather's clear. There's no need for activation. But if the county were to, to change to a red color, that means we've recommended. Uh, we're not ordering. We're just recommending that we need spotters. It's basically when our crew we would really like to get spotter reports. Uh, we, we would want them any time, but this was a, a particular set weather setup that we know we're going to need spotter reports. So. Uh, the little, you know, you'll also see there's a table that says when, if the county is activated plus the map. But a couple years ago, we added these little markers too. And what those are is if we get a storm report from someone, you or you know, really anyone, and then we retransmit it out for anyone to see, uh, it, it leaves a little marker on there, so if you were to mouse over those, you would see that uh, hail has been reported or wind. And since you kind of have the advantage in this room of being kind of in the middle of our area, you might actually, you know, if there's quite a bit of severe weather reports coming in from the west, you might actually get to kind of see what we're getting for reports before it gets into the area. So you kind of you can look at, for those, too. So some of our western counties don't always have that luxury that you might have here. So. So, again, another source of guidance for you if you want to know if spotters are recommended. 
We try not to uh, activate either for like isolated hailstorms. Let's say there's one hailstorm that's hitting Stoddard and it's just going to clip the county in the southeast end. We're not going to recommend activation for the entire county. But if it's anything tornado related, high winds impacting you know more than just one community, that sort of thing, kind of widespread, we will uh, typically recommend this activation. So. All right. Again, we talked about mobile versus not mobile. Uh, you don't have to be one of the mobile spotters in the room here. And, you know, like fire department site will oftentimes go out and kind of look around their community. The amateur radio clubs in town, I know, I you know, can't thank you enough. A lot of you go out and pass along what you're seeing out there. Uh, but you can do this from home or, or mobile. Just try to find spots that have good visibility. You know, the, uh, storm chasers, they hate coming into Wisconsin, right, because it's hills and trees and it's poor visibility for them. So try to find a, a spot that you can see these different features that we're going to start talking about next year, or especially in the second half. So, All right, those are some ideas on deploying. So let's move on to the, you know, the funner things and actually start talking about storms here, the actual observing stage, the actual storm spotting. And I mentioned storm chasers just a few seconds ago. Just as a reminder, I'm not here tonight to teach people how to storm chase. Uh, storm chasers do their thing. The spotters, we're, we're kind of talking about local information, being used locally, um, staying locally, that sort of thing. So we use a lot of video from storm chasers, uh, and I can't thank them enough for that. But a lot of the storm chasers out there, it's, it's more of a hobby, or for some it might be a chance to get some media exposure. I don't know, but uh, they're, a lot of times they're not calling or relaying their information directly with the community or us. Some do, but not all. And so uh, we're really talking about spotters communicating here locally in our area. So let's get into the thunderstorm itself. And I'm not here tonight to teach you how to be meteorologists or anything. Or I don't want to get too deep into science. But I, I will just talk about a few of these concepts because the wind flow associated with the storm can help you kind of figure out what you might be experiencing or what might occur here. So, you know, the initial stages of thunderstorms, uh, a warm, muggy day doesn't always have to be super warm, but relative to that time of year, we'll get the clouds start to grow, uh, thunderstorms starting to build. And these initial stages, we're talking about just warm air rising. Because the air is rising, uh, there's no precipitation, typically, at the onset. It has to grow and <coughs> kind of build first. So typically rain-free, air is going up, we'll call it an updraft, that warm air rising in the storm. Uh, the middle stages, we still have that updraft. It's, it's what grows and builds the storm. We'll talk quite a bit about that. But now we have the rain precipitation is starting to fall out of the storm. That's a cooling process, so we have rain, cooled air coming out. And so we get rain sinking or the cool air sinking out, something we call a downdraft, sometimes a downburst or a gust of wind coming out. Uh, of course, the rain and hail. We'll talk about those hazards in a little bit here. But updrafts and downdrafts. The final stages. It could be all downdraft, so it basically is killing itself. It's, it's taking all that warm air out of the area, and, and it tends to dissipate. And that's why, of course, it always, you know, it's typically cooler after a storm line comes through or uh, a storm pops up and it tends to cool down. It might be the cold front is moving on out of the area that's sparking the storms. It, it could be a, a number of things. By the way, severe weather doesn't always happen with just cold fronts. If you're watching the weather maps and stuff, sometimes uh, we can get tornado outbreaks on the leading edge of warm air coming in, too, warm air. So it, uh, the actual cold front, warm front thing isn't always a player in it, but it uh, kind of depends on the setup. We'll, we'll talk about that in the second half a little bit. So just a few things visually. Updrafts, again, we're talking about warm air growing these storms, rising up in it. So a lot of times if the, the updrafts are stronger, and that's kind of a day when we would say it's unstable or the thunderstorms are going to be more energized or stronger, you might see this cauliflower approach, this more vertical kind of look to the storms. Here's another example, again, warm air rising and, and building these storms. Another example here, yeah, there's a little bit of rain falling, but intense updrafts, just a visual clue that, you know, the, the storm is, is building uh, pretty fiercely, pretty strongly there. And uh, I've showed this for a number of years, but a nice visual moving away from the cameraman of a thunderstorm late evening, trying to get going. Maybe just not enough cool air out there. All 
I should say, too much cool air to get it to, to keep going, that sort of thing. But everything that goes up, of course, must come down. So you've got your updrafts, but then we start to see the downdraft part of it. So we've got that rain-cooled air coming out of the storm. It's cooler. It starts to sink. It, it, it hits the ground. It can't go in the ground, so it spreads out. And that's where we get those gusts front, or maybe even damaging you know, gust front winds, or uh, gusts of wind. Something called a downburst, where it's kind of a localized push of, of stronger winds. So visually, when you see that rain core or rain shower, that's probably or is the downdraft area. Here's a, a shot from the desert southwest, but it's a really nice kind of example of a downburst or this uh, rush of rain and rain cooled air hitting the ground and kind of spreading out. Here's another example where you've got rain cooled air coming out, and in this case, actually picking up some dust. Kind of a unique shot. Uh, a couple of time lapses here. Some of you, again, may have seen in the past, but of passing showers or, or passing thunderstorms here. This one really details it where they're that shot. <coughs> and then one of my favorites is the boater going out in the lake and uh, sees the downburst coming and takes a right turn right there. <laughs> <laughs> but now you can see the, the wind and rain coming across the lake there. We'll let that play one more time. So maybe they had enough weather training or could visually see it coming, but they knew something was a was coming in. So you can see the rain coming out there. <laughs> no hesitation there. But it came back right before it went in. Yeah, yeah. Well, the fishing was good right after, right? Probably. Mm -hmm. or something. All right, so another example, again, downbursts or downdrafts, uh, that rain cooled air sinking out from the storm. All right, so that kind of gives you a little bit flavor of the wind. And then in the second half, we talk about severe storm types. We can bring some of those concepts back in. Uh, so before we do that, let's talk about some of the hazards we get from, from severe thunderstorms. Uh, the hail, the, the, the rain, the, of course, lightning, things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about what we want, what we would like uh, reported to us, too, as spotters. Now, I'm going to push the, the flooding and flash flooding. Now, we, I, I talked at the introduction today about flooding, uh, river flooding, you know, is what we're really concerned with right now. Uh, that's kind of a different ballgame, right? It, it, typically, I mean, the smaller rivers in the area might rise kind of quickly, and it could be a little bit of what the word flash means here, in other words, quick. Uh, but the Mississippi River, it's going to take a while to come up, and then, you know, probably a while to go down, that sort of thing. When we talk about flash flooding, we're talking about typically thunderstorm rains, uh, excessive thunderstorm rains on a given evening, maybe several rounds of thunderstorms has hit an area. And when you start talking about the terrain in the region, the coulees, the, you know, the valleys and hills like that, it enhances that runoff. It can make it more uh, happen quicker. And so that's where we end up with problems. And, and I've been in, in the agency since 1988, but here in La Crosse since 95, and by far the biggest killer uh, since our office kind of spun up back in the mid-90s was is, is flooding. I think we've had 16 fatalities in the region here, and, and you know, I always have to knock on wood, none from tornadoes. So you kind of got to keep things in perspective here. Flash flooding can be a big deal in area. Pictures from the last two or three years. You know, almost every community, northeast Iowa, southeast Minnesota, here in Wisconsin, we've had, we've set some records and stuff. I'm not going to talk about climate change or anything uh, tonight, but one of my counterparts at the office is putting this presentation together for next week. I think he's presenting it, talking about when you start looking back at the number of river levels that are setting records in the last couple of decades compared to the long time ago, and how many of our cooperative rainfall observers are setting new records, you know, stuff. And um, there just seems to be a lot more issues with runoff and flooding lately uh, than years and years ago. As far as spotting goes, you know, it's always difficult for people to, to see flash flooding occurring at night. Imagine heavy rain and you're driving along. That might be your visibility. So you might not even know that there is a, uh, a flood potential there. Uh, but I, one of my extra duties at the office is I study U.S. flood fatalities across the country. And uh, about 90% of all the flood fatalities are people driving into or going into high water. It's very really rare that a flash flood comes and sweeps someone away. It's usually them making a poor choice in driving into high water. 
When it comes to Scotland, too, we would like to know about street flooding. Now, across, anyone living across, it's <coughs> very common in some areas, but uh, just so you know, for your community, it, uh, we would appreciate knowing about you know, street flooding, and, and be careful of that when you're out there. Uh, it may not always be a fatality producer, but damaged cars. I know one of the instances in 2018, there were uh, daughters of some of the people we work with got their cars stuck in some of the intersections of the cross and uh, totally wrecked their car. But be careful with, with flooding out there. Be careful, you know, if there is a flooding, we would like to know about closures. Uh, but you might not be able to spot those low water crossings or those areas that typically flood. So uh, be really careful about that. And, and we would like to know about them so we can get those, those flash flood uh, warnings out there. Be cautious at night. Again, it doesn't take much water to make the average vehicle float. A lot of the pictures we showed here were back from August of 2007. And that's where we lost about eight lives here in the region from that 10 to 15 inches of rain that fell over that 24-hour period in the region. All right, let's say a few things about lightning. <clears throat> now, lightning can occur with every thunderstorm, not just the ones we put warnings out on. So uh, certainly a threat as a spotter. Uh, but you, know, you never know exactly where that lightning strike might occur. It's not always right underneath the storm where it's raining heavy or where it's hailing or anything like that. So be a little cautious if you start hearing thunder, stay closer to the vehicle or in the vehicle if you're mobile, uh, stay closer to your house, that sort of thing. Just be alert for that threat out there. Some uh, video of lightning strikes and their power here. <laughs> Vaporizing that tree and then uh, the shot from Chicago a couple years ago. <laughs> what better line? Yeah, no match there, right? <laughs> so lightning is you know one of the biggest threats probably as a spotter. Well, when we talked about where to storm spot, we talked about you know uh, good visibility areas, maybe higher uh, ridge tops or that sort of thing, open areas. Be, you know, be, uh, if you put the two together, you realize that that's also a more lightning prone area. You know, your ridge tops, that sort of thing. So you don't have to tell us us where our office is up on a ridge with a hundred foot tower that we get struck on quite a bit. So um, be careful in, in the lightning. Staying in your vehicle is is usually pretty safe. So all right, let's talk a little bit about hail. Now, severe thunderstorm warnings. We typically are looking for uh, a certain size or one inch hail. We're also, of course, concerned with the damaging wind, which we'll get into next. Uh, when, when we uh, have hail in the area, we would like to know about the hail that you're seeing out there. Uh, we don't need to know about, we don't need 20 reports of pea-sized hail, but anything larger, you start getting to uh, half-inch size coins. Uh, objects that are consistent in size are good ways to, to relate to. Uh, we would like to know about it. So you got your coins, your golf balls, let's hope, you know, was it April? 2011, we had a big hail storm come through town, and we had a lot of bigger size hail. Uh, we try to avoid the phrase marble size hail. I push that every year. But marbles do come in different sizes, so sometimes that act, we need to clarify that, or you know, we make assumptions that you're talking about a half inch size marble. So try to stick with objects that are consistent in uh, size there. A couple years ago, this was some of the damage in our communities. You know, you get one of those prolific hail storms that comes through, and Final siding, crops, roofs, windows, you name it. A lot of damage there. If you ever wondered what injuries look like in large hail, that's what, uh, if you're caught out in it, that's from a track event years ago in Grinnell, Iowa, I believe, at a collegiate track event. And you can see some of the examples of, of large hail. I think the one in the bottom center there is one of the April 2011 hailstorms that we had in the area here. So. Some of you have seen this, but a great example of very large hail, kind of a helpless feeling, but he's actually calls it in to someone, I don't know if it's uh, media or, or weather service or whatever he's calling it in. You can imagine what happens to the windows in So 
again, the different sizes, uh, this is kind of a comparison chart. Uh, one inch or larger is what we shoot our warnings for. Uh, again, we would like to know other sizes so that we can kind of keep um, a compare of how intense that storm is. The radar does give us estimates on you know, the potential hail size. Sometimes we can see the, what we would call the hail core or the uh, uh, higher, the, the, the brighter colors, if you will, on the radar are, are, are staying aloft in the storm. And so that mean, tells us as meteorologists that that ice is kind of hanging up there as we try to get alerts before it descends to the ground and does its damage. But um, that's kind of some comparisons of what you can use there. So. All right, let's talk about wind here. Then we'll take a break. So one of the other, of course, really common aspects of a, of a thunderstorm is the, the strong winds that come out of it. Those downbursts, those downdrafts that are coming out of it. Uh, almost every storm produces some kind of gusty winds, of course. A lot of times it's a problem with trees, branches, lighter weight objects, and we'll get into that in a second. Now the speed that is official for us uh, for our severe thunderstorm warnings is up there, 58 miles per hour, about the speed limit or so. That's kind of what we shoot for when we issue severe thunderstorm warnings uh, with those speeds. Uh, but I will tell you, there's a little gray area there. You know, if there is a storm that is producing a lot of tree damage and maybe we're only getting reports of winds about 50, 45, we're probably not going to try to dice up hairs, try to get a warning out. But this is kind of the speed that typically we, we have life-threatening type damage. So that's where we're shooting at there. That's the type of damage we uh, you know, might see trees down, campsites, barns, outbuildings, carports, um, you know, maybe corn damage, uh, you name it. That's kind of typical with wind damage. One of the challenges is when we have a strong wind burst like this come through an area is the tornado versus wind gusts. And uh, we'll talk about that after the break, but you know, we can get <coughs> tornadoes sometimes in these strong wind gusts, but I hope people realize that they can't have wind damage without a tornado there too, because it, it certainly does occur. So uh, we try to do our best in determining what actually occurred out there. So let's, uh, we've got a mix of skills here in the room with spotting, but let's just look at a few examples here and, and talk about what we might think these wind speeds are. So this is a, a thunderstorm coming through a community and Based on some of the introduction stuff I gave you, would you do you think this is in the severe criteria? No. no. All right, looks like most of you are shaking your head no. Yeah, this is probably, I, I would probably estimate about 40, maybe a little higher, but it's it's a sub-severe storm for us. It gets your attention. There might be some leaf litter down in the streets. Uh, it might ruin your afternoon picnic and things like that, but it's, it's probably not going to kill people. I mean, there could be a rogue branch going down, but uh, that's not the type of storm that we try to get a lot of warnings out on. Let's, uh, of course, we're going to take it up a notch, right? Let's, let's see what this is. I mean, there's pretty poor visibility, but that's not really what we use. But. Maybe like in plenty of wind? Yeah. So I guess by a show of hands, who, who, would, who would issue a warning on this? Who thinks this is severe? Okay, let's, it's kind of interesting. That's maybe about half. Yeah, you're getting close here. I, I can understand why you're kind of holding the fence. Now, some of you might have been looking at the trees. Well, yeah, the trees uh, are staying up. But I would think some of those stronger wind gusts, the squalls in them, if you will, probably got close to 60 there. I think estimating that about 60 would be a good, a good spot. There's even some, looks like a little bit of debris down. But we probably need warnings on that. There's probably going to be barns down, things like that, from that kind of wind. Uh, we'll make it even simpler here. Well, I, sorry, I hit the wrong button and put up the speeds. Yeah. Watch the example on the right here. Yeah, there's there's no no questions there, right? That's corn is. A, I'm not a corn expert, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Some ages, it depends on the age of the corn and its condition and stuff, but. Sometimes corn can actually take a little bit of beating and come back, but sometimes it just flattens it down. It kind of depends on the storm. But so yeah, certainly those uh, speeds would be severe. So when you're estimating those wind speeds, and that's what we're asking you to do, is uh, it does take some experience. Now most people, their first go through on this, tend to overestimate the winds. They tend to say it's too high. So again, if you're new to this, I, I mentioned at the beginning, be conservative. Be conservative with tornado spotting, but also 
uh, the wind gusts. If you take a little bit off of what you think is occurring, it might be closer, unless you're pretty experienced with this. Try to avoid vague phrases like heavy or strong winds, because that can really vary from person to person. Um, some years we'll say, you know, they're, they're really blustery, you know, or something. We don't really know what that means out there. If you have ways to measure the gusts, you have your own weather station and you feel good about those numbers, yeah, uh, David up here has got an example of like a handheld anemometer, and there's there's different stuff you can buy on the web. You don't have to do that kind of stuff, but uh, let us know it's a measured wind gust. Uh, it's kind of funny through the years, though, people get a new weather station and they'll they'll call in a, a wind gust of 80 miles per hour or something like that, and then we're like, boy, no one else is reporting that. So we'll ask them, if you get that high a wind, do you have trees down? Is there any damage? Is there a roof's damage? And they'll say, no, no, you know, stuff. And then, then we find out the next day that he got a new weather station and he accidentally read the temperature instead of the <laughs> <laughs> So be sure you know what that was going You're measuring there. So. Um, for the more experienced people in the room, too, uh, just a few words is, you know, when you talk about estimating wind speeds, having a tree down or branch down isn't an automatic flag. Kind of like when people say, well, it had to be in a tornado because I saw twisting in the trees. To be honest, it's not always a perfect one-to-one. -one. But look at some of these examples. A, a, a lot of the examples we'll get, there's rot in the tree, the tree condition. Um, it might be a weak spot and it broke off, or maybe one tree has very little roots and the surrounding trees all look fine. Here's some examples from last year. I mean, look, so, some of these just, they had no uh, root ball at all, or it was rotting, and this one has hardly any root system, so just, you know, a sub-severe wind knocked them over. So uh, I'm not asking you to necessarily take all that into account, but I think for the more experienced people in the room, if you're, you, you know, if you're driving down Market Street here in town or something, and you see a tree down, but it's the only tree, uh, realize that that's, I mean, we, we probably want to know about it, but that's not, what we typically would issue warnings on if it's just a, a road case like that. So. All right, I've gone long enough here for this first half. Oh, I'm sorry. One more to, to show you. So how do you know those uh, different speeds? Well, again, it takes some experience. There is a little bit of information on the yellow sheets there. Uh, Sub-severe, up to about 50, you're going to have leaf litter down, small twigs, branches. And then as you start getting the larger branches, trees breaking and things, then you're past that 58. I guess, magic number that we shoot for. Structural damage. Uh, over uh, 75, you're going to have roofs damage, and there definitely should be reports of something going on with those higher end speeds. You know, through the years, there have been talk about, and I think some communities have done this, about having a, our severe thunderstorm warnings kind of for that 58 to 70 mile per hour, and then we need something for those rare cases. And if any of you remember the June windstorms of 1998, we had cases come through the area here where it was definitely above 70, uh, maybe as close to 90 in some cases where you had just widespread damage. Uh, some, some people have said we need a different type of higher end warning for those, um, but those typically will bring widespread severe weather. So. All right, now is our break time. I apologize for that. So a, a few things just um, before I, I let you go here. If you want to sign up for those outlooks or the activations, I'll have that up here. Uh, the break or afterwards. There's also several people in the room for the Riverland Amateur Radio Club or involved with amateur radio that if you're interested in that, I'm going to talk about it in the second half, but if you're interested in, in using that as a way to get into the hobby and communicate with us directly, um, there's some in the back side here and Dave up front here can help you. There's some others, so we'll them up. All right, we'll take a little break here. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby, let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy, the chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby. To get ourselves a treat. All right, thanks again, Alan. All right, let's jump back into it here. Uh, appreciate everyone that signed up there. And again, those uh, sign-in sheets will be up here at the end if you didn't get a chance. All right, let's, let's talk about, uh, again, we're talking about severe storms, and let's talk about the different storm types here. 
Uh, and if you were to go on into Google, like I did here, and type severe storm types, look at the variety you get. Kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning, kind of the introduction stuff was every storm has a different look to it. It plays out differently, just like each year will play out. But we're going to try to simplify it uh, for you and, and kind of stick <coughs> to the basics here. So when we talk about severe thunderstorm types here, there's this whole spectrum from single storms to lines uh, of storms to sometimes supercell storms uh, that we will get into even here in Minnesota or Wisconsin. Uh, but there's a, there's a big variety as you can see here and you might be wondering well why some days do we get a line of storms and other days we get the, the tornadoes like in 2011 and things like that. Well, there's, you know, we look at how unstable the atmosphere and things like that, but really to organize your storm type, we start looking at more of the meteorology, which is the, the wind shear. So it's basically the wind setup in the atmosphere is different from, from storms to storms, from time of, of year sometimes, and so that can sometimes determine what type of storm mode we're going to get. A lot of times, you know, you talk about Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Oklahoma, they, they tend to see maybe more of the classic supercells. Uh, up here, we tend to get a, a kind of a hybrid of a lot of these, so you can have combinations of it. We can have combinations where it, it starts off in western Minnesota as individual supercells. Again, we're going to talk about that, and then by the time it gets to lacrosse here, it's, it's formed into a line. So it, it can also change depending on the age of the storms out there. So uh, I'll show you a few examples. Uh, a lot of you look at radar and you just kind of want to know how that compares. Single cell storm might look like you see in the upper left there. You see this um, individual storm pop up, and visually you might see it out there. In the south, they get a lot of that kind of popcorn thunderstorm activity. More common for us is we get the squall lines, or, or these lines of storms coming through. These are some different animations, some different examples, and we're going to talk about that cloud type and, and these cloud formations here in a little bit to bring a big variety of different hazards. And then the supercells, where you get individual isolated or, or tend to be more isolated severe storms uh, producing again almost any type of weather but uh, we talk about tornadoes and visually being able to see tornadoes uh, this might be the main player for that this is a radar shot from a big tornado outbreak in uh, in uh, 2011 down in April in, in uh, Alabama all right so those kind of the, an introduction now when we talk about again May 22nd 2011 this is a radar loop and the purple polygons you see on there are the tornado warnings that were being issued. We kind of had supercells. They were kind of isolated, severe storms or strong storms. Uh, maybe not as classic as you might see on some of the radar imagery, but this was kind of a supercell here. And then as it got close to La Crosse, or started reforming another tornado in uh, Houston County near Hoka, this was the supercell this part of the storm on radar. Yeah, yeah, there was other storms down here kind of clouding the picture, but uh, this is kind of a, one of these hybrids, if you will. They're not completely isolated, but they have a lot of characteristics like supercells. And of course, this kind of hook here it went right through uh, the cross area. So we'll, we'll see some video of the tornado there in a second. All right, so lines of storms, squall lines. We'll spend a little bit of time on this because we get these uh, a little more common, I guess you could say. The first threat, the main threat from these is going to be strong winds, damaging wind. We talked a little bit about wind in the first half. Uh, a lot of times the leading edge is going to be the wind gust. That's going to be the main player. But, of course, we could get heavy rain. We could see hail on these. And there are instances where tornadoes do spin up along these squall lines, maybe 25% of the time or so in our part of the country here. Uh, but those are challenging. They're going to be short-lived. You're might not see it, the contrast is poor, there's all kinds of, uh, it's a different animal than a supercell tornado uh, as we go through this, you're going to see that. So a lot of times with these squall line features, we're talking about wind damage. But I do have a few case examples where they did produce tornadoes, because it seems like the last four to five years we've been getting a lot of uh, little tornadoes from these, these squall lines. This was back from 2014 down in southern Wisconsin, down near Platteville, this is northeast Iowa. And you can see the line of storms that was coming through the area and the damage that it did at Platteville. We were able to verify a tornado, a pretty healthy tornado, that moved through there with that line of storms. So it's not always wind, but uh, most of the time it is. And there's one from, I think, 2016. You got this squall line moving through, kind of embedded in this 
line of strong winds are, were little tornadoes. And so the yellow boxes you see on here were our severe thunderstorm warnings, and the little red isolated boxes, you can kind of see them pop up and disappear at times, were our tornado warnings. So there's spots where it might look a little bit more rotational on radar, or maybe the spotters are reporting higher end type of damage or something like that. So, but, and then this was the damage from, again, kind of surrounding region here. Uh, wind damage, but some localized tornado damage. Just a few more examples. Already uh, this time, two years ago, if you remember this early season, March 6th, we had this really thin squall line come through the region. And uh, we had the little tornado that uh, formed out near Interstate 90, uh, east of West Salem there, towards... Uh, towards... Um, Ferry Mills. Ferry Mills and... Uh, Bangor, right, thank you. I have a drawn up blank there. Between Bangor and West Salem. Yeah, so we had a lot of wind damage, but there was that little tornado path in there. So that's kind of what you typically see from these squall lines. And one last case, July of 2017, again, squall line moving through the whole region. But there are areas where that line kind of bows or curls, and that's where we kind of watch for uh, possible spin up activity. If I overlay the actual tornado reports from there, that's how it occurs. So. It would be foolish for us at, in our agency to, to put tornado warnings up and down that line. It, we would lose so much you know, trust in people. So typically, like I said, we'll handle it with severe thunderstorm warnings and then try to pick out the corridors. In this case, we were able to pick out the tornado down here at McGregor. Went right through town. Here's some of the footage. You might remember this on the news. Some of the paths and the corn. I wish we could get airborne on every damage survey. You can see so much more. But... Uh, that's the type of damage that these isolated tornadoes can do. So I sold you on a lot of evidence why tornadoes can occur in this, but I want to bring you back to the wind threat because a lot of these cases, like this, this was uh, passed on to me from northeast Wisconsin of, of a squall line tornado, but it's kind of rare to see squall line tornadoes like this. Most of the searches, if you went on YouTube and you know looked for tornadoes, most of the cases you're going to see are are going to be supercell tornadoes or, or not from squall like this. A lot of the cases, this is our challenge. You've got a squall line coming in, dark skies, heavy rain, and where are you going to see? What, how are you going to report that you know, as a tornado? So it's really hard to get tornado reports from these. It's, a lot of times the wind damage occurs. Then we hear about, okay, there might be a corridor where a tornado occurred, but hardly anyone is, is going to be able to see it. All right, so um, we talk about the cross sections of these squall lines now, or kind of a side look here. We had the red arrows or updrafts building the storm, the rain, cool air, the blue arrows kind of falling, in this case, kind of towards the back, the downdraft areas, kind of moving from left to right. And as that wind is coming out of the storm, producing that damaging uh, gusts, it, it kind of advances along with the storm, and sometimes can push out the cloud and make it look kind of like a wedge or a shelf. So, especially for the new people here tonight, the, the first cloud we're going to name is that shelf cloud. Uh, it's this leading edge cloud phenomenon, a wedge-shaped appearance that is marking the gust front as these strong winds uh, come through. It's the area of, of air going out and away from the storm. So you're going to be hit in the face with it, and it's going to go on by your location. You've got to be careful of trees and power lines, all those kind of features. So let me show you several examples of shelf clouds here. <coughs> Some of you may have seen some of these in the past, but here's an example. This is the shell cloud down here, kind of raggedy. Uh, that's maybe you know, more of what we type see crossing the river here, or crossing your area, coming towards the photographer in this case. Here's another example. This was taken out in southern Minnesota where the wind farms flatter. Um, very classic look to it. And uh, that would kind of mark the gust as it comes on through. Here's another very expansive shell cloud. Here's one um, crossing the Mississippi River. Another nervous boater, perhaps? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to outrun that one, I don't think. But you can see the, the line coming through. Another newer time lapse I have. But look at all these little fingers hanging down here, too. That, that can sometimes fool the public or fool the untrained eye. They'll see those coming in. They'll instantly think they're funnels or something like that hanging down. And um, the dispatch centers will get these calls. And then you know we kind of look at the radar and we 
we might not be right 100% of the time, but most of the time we're, we're theorizing that people are seeing the, the, the loose clouds kind of along with the shelf cloud as it comes in. I'll show you a few more examples. Here's a shelf cloud coming in from left to right, so you'd have to prepare yourself for, for strong winds. You can see the dark skies in the background here. And another example showing those fingers kind of hanging down, kind of a raggedy looking shelf cloud there. And it gets very turbulent underneath as it goes on by, you know, once the winds hit your area. But those would not be funnel clouds or anything like that. One time lapse here, back from the St. Louis area, uh, you can see the shelf cloud coming in. And then right behind it, the strong wind gusts and then the rain starts to pick up a little bit after that. So. So all marking that, that gust front. Now, there are occasions where this shell cloud might kind of take on a rolling look or a, kind of a horizontal roll looking part to the cloud. This was one from last year over in Harmony, Minnesota. Uh, it still is a line, still linear. You know, it's still marking the gust front, but it kind of rolls on past your location. Here's a nice time lapse I found from the Chicago area, I believe, but kind of showing you this roll cloud moving over. Just a gust front that is out there. So roll cloud, shelf cloud, it's going to be marking the, the gust front. We really don't need these reported to us, but it, it's a visual clue for you to kind of what to expect as the uh, gusts of wind come across. So either of these, we're talking about air going out and away from the storm. And that's when it's going to be hitting you in the face and doing that, that gust of wind. That's just not a classic tornado development area uh, like we think about with what we're going to go on to next, the supercells. Tornadoes, uh, you know, at least the supercell ones, will form in, in a vacuum where air is kind of going up and into the storm. And these are cases where air is going out and away. So let's, let's look at supercells there and kind of cross and compare here. So a couple times a year we might get into a supercell environment. We're talking about more isolated storms that are oftentimes producing some kind of severe weather. Large hail is very common with them, uh, associated with that, you know, heavy rains, maybe some strong winds. Uh, all that, big downdrafts, uh, but we do have our tornado word and highlighted in red because you know, most of our concerning tornadoes, I guess the, the, the bigger ones, are probably going to come from supercells, even you know, here in, La, in La Crosse in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So uh, another kind of, not a cross section, but a schematic here of one and uh, help you visualize how these supercells kind of look versus the squall lines. So on the front of these supercells, typically, you can see the storm movement is from left to right or towards me in this case. That's typically where our downdraft area is. It's where our rain and hail, uh, big shields of rain out ahead of it and stuff, maybe even wind gusts, all kind of that, that front part, this, the way it's headed, poor visibility, you know, you're just getting, kind of getting um, locked in, just heavy rain, you can't see much. Uh, towards the middle and back parts of the storm is our updraft region that is building and kind of sustaining these storms. So that's where our warm air is, is uh, determining how strong it's going to get. And if you remember back from the thunderstorm basics, the air is rising here so we have a lot less rain. It might even be a rain-free region, so much better visibility towards the middle and back parts of these supercell storms. And you can kind of see why a supercell could go on for hours across a, a state, like the one in 2011 uh, started in north central Iowa and, and didn't die until it got up to Nakusa, Wisconsin. It went for hours that afternoon, produced six tornadoes along its path. So you, you kind of watch the airflow here. The updraft goes up and then it comes down here. It never kind of coincides. It never lands back on itself and so it can keep going sometimes for a long time. So back in this area of the, the middle back part of the storm where the updraft is the strongest, uh, sometimes you'll see a lowering, an isolated lowering. And that's called the wall cloud. We'll get, I'll show you several examples of those. And it's from the wall cloud, especially if it's persistent, it takes on rotation. Uh, some of you have heard me say these in the past, but that's where we look for tornado activity. Uh, again, it can happen here, not as common maybe as other parts of the country, but uh, that is about our only chance of getting a tornado warning out uh, before it occurs if we get uh, ro rotational wall cloud reports and kind of sync it up with where it's at in the storm, it gives us a good idea of what to expect there. So, so I'll show you some different examples of these, but maybe you can kind of see where we're going with this, looking for wall clouds in these, and watching for rotation. So let me show you some different 
uh, shots of and, and uh, time lapses of supercells here. Here's just a still with a passing supercell storm. Rain is off to the right. The storm is moving towards me. That's your bad visibility area. And now we're looking underneath it. Updrafts coming in. You can actually see kind of the updraft in the cloud and maybe even a lowering here. Here's another still rain off in the background. Uh, but here is your rain free area and a wall cloud or lowering. Some time lapse of a supercell rain off here in the right. So, which direction do you think it's headed? Towards me, right, towards the right. And then, oh, something there, but <laughs> we've got a, a much better visibility area, rain free. And you can kind of watch, granted, a lot of these videos are, are um, time lapses, so it's a little cheating, but you can actually see the air rising into the wall cloud here, and maybe even rotation. Another example of a storm moving off kind of the background there, and we're kind of getting into the updraft region. And you know, that's, that's another reason why a lot of these storm chaser videos are located where they're at, because they're looking for the updraft region so they can watch for wall clouds and tornado development. You can kind of see the, maybe a little lowering there. And one more example, yes, it's from Oklahoma, but Try to find some newer video to show. Um, rain off the background, and here's the updraft. You can almost see the cloud billowing up, and uh, at least a rain for you, if not a lowering there. All right, so you can imagine uh, if you look, go back to that supercell schematic, where you're at in relation to the storm can make a big difference with these. If it's a squall line, you, can, you know, you might have basically the same weather from. Home into Stoddard, you know, or something in this area. But a supercell might make a difference. Like in 2011, uh, the supercell came in in La Crosse, south end of La Crosse. Uh, really, like on Alaska and Pullman, were really never under threat for that particular tornado. So you can imagine your visibility. Let's say we have a supercell coming across the, the county like this. If um, if we had firemen up in uh, Stevenstown area or, or Holman watching, they, they're, they're going to just see rain and dark skies, and they're not going to be able to see these features. But if there are crews down here in, um, boy, I'm having a terrible time with my memory tonight, but uh, out here on St. Joseph or Middle Ridge or, you know, the Shelby Fire Department, they might be able to see underneath it and see uh, the rain-free area, wall cloud, that sort of thing. It, it, it's not that we want everyone to keep moving around, but it, you know, having different groups out can give you different perspectives out there. Here's a case from Oklahoma a few years ago. Uh, this was the El Reno, Oklahoma case in 2013 that ended up killing some, some well-known storm researchers and storm chasers. But these were all time synchronized, the exact same time from four different angles. And you can see two of the angles, you can see the tornado pretty clearly. But the other two, it's just, um, you know, this looks like maybe a, a wall cloud or maybe it's hidden by some of the trees. and kind of the same thing here. So it, it, it kind of depends on your perspective uh, and distance uh, can make a big difference in what you're seeing out there. All right, so let's get back to the, some of the, the cloud basics here. Again, the main storm tower, just the strong updrafts. A lot of times these supercells, it's going to be cauliflower-like, very firm-looking, just suggestions of, of strong updrafts and unstable air out there. Um, a lot of times we're concerned with the cloud bottoms here in the uh, these features like the rain-free base, just identify that you're in the updraft region. That's what that's going to help you with. So you can see the rain area off to the right. And another, here's a still shot, drown drafts to the right, and they're keeping an eye on this updraft region for any development. Nice new time lapse from uh, north of here in Wisconsin, just to kind of show you this rain-free area. It's an updraft region. Maybe the storm is just just getting going, but the definite updrafts into that. Not really strong, clear rotation. Probably nothing you would need to report at this point, but it, it helps you give an identification that you've got a an updraft region there. So another time lapse. And most of the rain is kind of moved off to the right, but you've got this area kind of towards the back part of the storm that's trying to build a little bit of rain, but 
not that much. So let's talk then about the wall cloud. That would be that isolated lowering that is in that rain-free region. Uh, this is the updraft region. Uh, updraft, the air is going up and into the storm, usually towards the middle and back part of the storm. So again, shelf cloud, that wind would hit you in the face, gusts of wind, it would move past your location. If you're not sure what you're looking at with these wall clouds, especially if you're in a favored location and kind of around the storm looking at it, a lot of times the winds would be kind of hitting you in the back of the head or going in towards the storm, kind of inflowing towards it. Uh, so that might help you determine uh, what, you're, what you're kind of dealing with. So if you see a feature like this, of course, watch for persistence. We get wall clouds now and then, but does it hang around more than 10 minutes or so? And then certainly watch for signs of rotation. So that's what we would like to know about. Again, that would give us some lead time uh, that that storm is going on to produce uh, at least a possible tornado out there. So let me show you some different wall cloud examples and some videos here. Here's a, uh, again, rain off to the right, and you can see the lowering there in the rain-free base area. Here's another classic wall cloud, was not rotating, but hanging down there pretty low. Here's a time lapse that I think I've used from day one, but it's just a great example showing you that air ascending up into the storm and, of course, the rotation. A lot different looking than the shelf cloud, right? The squall line coming through, that's a whole different animal. This is a real speed one from uh, southwest Iowa, but it kind of shows you, uh, this one's real low to the ground. Distinct rotation, and then there was the, one of the tornadoes that came from it. Uh, southwest Minnesota, um, from the big outbreak in 2010, but you can see the distinct lowering of dark skies off to the background and right as the storm is kind of moving that way, not very fast, but it's, it's kind of drifting there and trying to get act together. And then uh, closer to home, this was over the city of Winona a few years back. Got, we weren't really expecting tornado activity on this day. We got a call of rotating wall cloud over the city. Uh, from several people, including the emergency manager and stuff, and that prompted us to a tornado warning, you know, based on the report. And it, this is the one that did touch down over the river, and then it went into the wildlife refuge. Uh, and so it didn't hit any buildings, but it did go into the trees and stuff. And it all started from getting those reports. I wouldn't say it completely caught us off guard, but we had to spin up pretty quickly. It's like, okay, we got two or three reports of rotating wall cloud. That storm is doing something. So, so it can happen in the in the valleys. All right, let me show you a real classic example. Yes, it's from Kansas, but it kind of shows you the whole thing again. Rain moving off to the right there. That's the front part of the supercell. And then the back where that updraft is, you can see uh, the rain-free base and the lowering start to develop. Rotation, and then just as classic as can be, we get the tornado. Doesn't happen like that very often around here. So I said, it just, each storm is a little different, but uh, that's kind of the process in uh, motion there. So, all right, finally gets us to the tornadoes. I don't know how many here were just wanted to see tornadoes tonight. We finally got it right. So we're talking about a connection with the ground. Uh, sometimes, and we'll get into funnel clouds. If you got rotation aloft, look around, look at the horizon, see if there's any evidence that is on the ground. So tornado, by definition, means we've got some kind of connection with the ground. It may not always be visible. Uh, we rank them based on uh, the, what's called the Enhanced Fujita or EF scale. It's not a perfect system. We really don't often know exactly how strong those winds are. But we'll look at the damage and we'll try to make comparisons. I always tell people that the scale, or the, the rating of a tornado, a lot of times could be off by one or by plus or minus one, excuse me. It's just uh, kind of depending on the evidence. Uh, we kind of go into detective mode and do our best with that. So. If you look at the, the ratings, though, it's kind of interesting that you know, a huge majority of our tornadoes are the smaller ones, the EF0s and EF1s. You know, every year we'll get a couple of those touched down somewhere in the, in the region. Kind of rare that you get to those, those higher level ones. But when you look at fatalities, it, it, it's the opposite. So we get a lot of small things, especially with the squall lines. We get those little 
quick spin-up tornadoes that no one can really see, but look at the number of fatalities. So again, it's kind of a debate in our business in the weather enterprise about how much on a squall line do we tornado warn? Or, you know, if we occasionally miss an EF0, how much is that a, a big deal compared to if we were to miss the tornadoes that do tend to kill people, the EF2s and higher? That would be a much bigger miss. Uh, but there's going to be cases where we miss EF0s, and, and there, there's this kind of push among the social media world, I suppose it is, but the public to say, how come you miss that? How can you miss that? Just realize these smaller ones, they, they have their own challenges. You know, can radar detect them? Are, are spotters going to be able to see them as clear? Things like that. Squalling, especially. So it's a, kind of a big debate in our, in our agency right now. All right, so some history. Uh, this is uh, the documented tornadoes that we have for La Crosse County. Uh, 1965 was still our last big one. Uh, but the 2011 one came into town down here, of course, and then reformed out here between Bangor and Rockland. That was just two of the six tornadoes that that supercell developed. And then we've had little touchdowns. There was one uh, uh, 2005 up here. I, I want to say, is that the September one? Anyway, we, we have some occasional small ones. And then I do have Houston County. I wasn't sure what the demographics would be tonight. Uh, but again, a little more quieter. Sometimes it has to do with spotter networks and terrain and things like that. But you can see the 2011 right near Hoka in the lacrosse here. So. so there's some history, but maybe not as much as further <laughs> west, further uh, uh, southwest, things like that, where it's flatter. Our climatology for this area, you can see why we do all the training in March and April. We get into May and June. That's typically our, our peak severe weather season. I know for our office, June is always the busiest month. It's the, you know, the severe weather season kind of peaks in June. And then we can get stuff. Last year, we had a tornado break in September, so it can happen. Um, but it tends to, to, to scale off quite a bit. So um, I always use Summerfest in Milwaukee as my exhale, because that's usually at the end of June and around the 4th of July. So uh, uh, we usually kind of say, ooh. Got through the bulk of the severe weather season, I guess you could say. Uh, Wisconsin averages 23 tornadoes a year. Last year we had 33 in the state. Uh, Minnesota averages 43. Last year there was 44, so somewhat uh, kind of a, a typical year. Here are some of the tornado plots from last year. Again, nothing in our particular area, but we had some just off to the east, smaller ones. And then in Minnesota, a lot of these tornadoes occurred on September 20th, late in the year. Uh, but we had a, a, a small one out uh, near Rushford, another small one down near Granger, Minnesota, which I have video of in a few slides here. So, All right, so most of our tornadoes, examples of EF0s, EF1s, short-lived, relatively weak wind speeds, and difficult for us to pick up. Sometimes they will on radar, sometimes not, and maybe not as easy for you, too, as a, as a spotter out there. Here's one of the ones from last year in Fillmore County, Minnesota. I don't know if you see it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a dust devil, but you have to take my word for it. There is severe thunder. I mean, there's a thunderstorm cloud above you, even though you see a lot of blue sky. But look at the little touch down here. See, the, this is a classic of very tough to get a warning out on this. And I don't, I don't think we got a warning out on this. But a little EF0 did some damage to some farms. I was in this county last week for the spotter training, and they, they made sure I knew there was some damage. I, I believe it, you know. <laughs> But it was uh, rated an EF0, of course. All right, let's move it up a little bit. EF1, here's an example in eastern Iowa. A little bit of rain wrapping up. And then we've got our May 22nd case. This was the tornado out near uh, Sparta that formed out near Rockland and then went through Sparta. Quite a bit of video from the Sparta area on this one. Uh, another example, EF1 out in uh, north central Iowa, or central Iowa, I should say. And he's calling it in. It was rated an EF1, almost EF2, but it didn't look that impressive, but it was doing damage. So then we get up to the EF2s and EF3s. Uh, again, since our radar was put online, I think we've detected five. You know, EF2s or 3s, so it's not that many that we see around here. But when it does occur, it's going to last longer. You know, what hit lacrosse, you're going to have more damage. 
Um, we're really fortunate on that day in lacrosse, we had no fatalities. I think what we had injuries after the fact from cleanup. Yeah, yeah stuff like that. So uh, stronger wind speeds, easier to detect for you and then also for us. I uh, hope that we wouldn't miss too many of these, if any. So this was an EF3 from 2014 and then Lewiston in 1999 uh, in EF2. So some examples. This was the first tornado of the six on our day. It started out in northern Iowa, crossed into uh, near Harmony, Minnesota. In fact, we thought Harmony, Minnesota was going to get hit, and luckily it, it, it dissipated and kind of veered off. But that was uh, what it looked like out there. The 2004 one out near Minnesota Iowa State Line. And so the storm spotters were the first ones to alert trailer. us that there was tornado trailer activity. It could be a house in the past. That was a storm spotter, one of our amateur radio operators from Cresco, Iowa, following it. Uh, EF2 down in Illinois, 2016. You know, they all kind of look a little different. This almost has kind of a shelf cloud appearance to it. But you can see the tornado underneath that. The updrafts. It's kind of moving towards the rain off in the background there. This isn't anywhere close, obviously, New Orleans, but I thought uh, it's a pretty good newer video, EF3, that they had that day. I haven't had time yet to download any of the recent stuff in the south, but I don't know if there was a lot of good footage there. And then, of course, the rare fours and fives. Luckily, we don't have much history of that in the area. Uh, pretty rare. You know, the last one they hit, Wisconsin, was 1996. Uh, an F4 or 5, so talking about winds, you know, greater than 165, 200 miles per hour, I'd like to think we would see this coming down I-90 or, you know, wherever it's headed, uh, assuming daylight, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. So. Uh, some examples, EF4 down in northern Illinois. It always blows my mind how people can just keep driving. <laughs> and there's some footage, I believe, from people that were caught under that underpass or near it, had the tornado go right overhead. Uh, Nebraska case from 2014, and yeah, they're way too close, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is two tornadoes here, almost like they're trying to get in between them, right? Now, interestingly enough, these supercells turned into a small line, and the day Plateau was hit with that tornado that night, that was this set of storms. I mean, it had turned into a small line. So, starting the supercells in Nebraska, I can remember our office watching internet footage of those tornadoes, and then later that evening, we were in the midst with our own storms from there. So, and then you get to the big outbreak in 2011 from from different areas. Here's the Alabama outbreak. I've shown this for a number of years now. Hard to believe it was rated in EF4. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anyone's ratings were off, but it's hard to believe that it didn't hit the higher end damage here. Very significant tornado. This was one of the first tornadoes that really captured our minds of how we word our warnings and what we do in our agency because of so many lives were lost in 2011, yet most of these storms had really good warnings on them. So it's not just getting a good warning, it's having the community prepared, having all that information coming together to get people to react. And then we got the day that we were hit. There was one reason why the media wasn't around talking about the big tornado outbreak in La Crosse and stuff is because Joplin, Missouri was hit and you had about 153 lives lost from uh, this tornado. I just wanted to show the start of it again. How violent and quickly it becomes a monster.
problems when you get a tornado this size. Even if you have warnings and there's places for people to go, is just how do you get out of the path of it? You know, it's, Gets to at least a mile wide or so when it goes into Java. You see how just big it, it becomes just a big mass. It seems like. I got it. 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 Stop! 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 You would still see rotation. Remember, that has to be a component of it. Uh, but keep an eye on the horizon. If you're not sure if it's touching down or not, tell us at least you've got a funnel cloud. We might have other information we can add that to. Uh, it might be enough to prop tornado warnings just like that. So, but um, be sure of what you're looking at. Some of the other examples of funnels here of the region. Remember, we're, we're asking you to confirm that it's touching the ground. So you've got a tornado. And, and funnel cloud here. You got to kind of keep an eye on the horizon, see if you see any evidence that there is a touchdown here. Smaller tornadoes, especially, it's not always going to be visible from from the funnel or the you know funnel looking thing to down to the, the debris on the ground. All right, I mentioned already every every year is a little different, uh, but there are these little gray areas. There's these uh, hybrids of all these different things that can um, give you challenges. You know, so that's why it takes experience with this. So let's just talk a little bit about some of these. Not all the tornadoes that we're going to see, if we see any at all, are going to be just nice out there in the open and things like that. As we saw in some of the videos, sometimes they become rain wrapped and, and you might not be able to see them. So this is a challenge, um, especially with the squall line ones. Again, contrast and everything, you're not going to be able to see them very well. So rain wrapped, if you lose it in the rain, don't assume anything out there. If you can't see it anymore, you just say it's you know lost in the rain somewhere. Sometimes, though, you can see power lines flashing. It must be something still on the ground there. That might help you out. If we go back to uh, May of 2011, and this is courtesy of uh, Dan already left, but Channel 19 here in town. They had their webcam on their tower looking south of their station. And that was the tornado that went across the river, coming out of Hoka and, and hit La Crosse. But notice that it's very rain wrapped. People, people really never saw a tornado you know, classic looking tornado as it came through in La Crosse here. It was so wrapped up in rain and there was so much rain with it. Uh, I, if any of you remember that video from the bus that was down near Green Island Ice Arena in Gunderson Hospital, uh, of course it's in a bus, but you don't see any tornado, it's just the, the debris kind of hits there. And here's a still shot taken from the marina, the south side of town. It just kind of looked like a mass coming in. So that, you know, that's, that's a challenge. How are we going to get spotter reports if it's kind of a, a mass like this, but I mean the information really helped though of what people could give us on that day. Another challenge, um, sometimes we get funnels or what we call non-supercell storms that will produce little funnels but they don't have those big supercell characteristics. You can see in some of these shots how blue sky above it and stuff. Uh, no tornado watch is likely with these. So if you do see these little funnels hanging down, let us know. We, uh, sometimes we'll put a note out with the help of the media telling them that we're expecting these little funnels to form. They're probably not going to touch down. If they do, be careful. We're trying to get better at determining the days that these exist, but uh, for the most part what we see happen is we, we know there's a risk of this type of weather setting up. We get a funnel cloud report, then we know, okay, we're going to get a bunch of these, and then we kind of handle it that way. But it's not the classic, a tornado watches out, supercells are advancing on our location or anything like that. So. Here's a day from last year where we had these uh, funnels. And yes, some of them were pretty low to the ground, but as far as we knew, we never had any uh, touchdowns. But, and this could have all been the same thing, just viewed from, from people in different communities. But this was all from kind of southeast Minnesota looking at a feature there. Uh, I just realized I got the same shot in these two. So. <laughs> Maybe I'd taken a little bit different. I don't know. I'll have to correct that. So. Uh, sometimes we have rain coming out of the sky, not reaching the ground, They're called verga, not too popular or too common in this area. Uh, sometimes, of course, the rain does hit the ground, and we talked about that already, the downdraft area. There would be no rotation here or anything like that, so if you see this mass, uh, you're probably just looking at that downdraft region of the rain. 
One of the trickier cloud features, uh, again, that might take some experience is just what we call scud clouds. Kind of a silly name, but loose, low-hanging cloud debris. That's not a shelf cloud, it's not a attached wall cloud or anything like that. And this, again, can give the, the general public fits, uh, get false reports with this kind of stuff, and the untrained uh, person. So you can kind of see these different examples. They might even have tornado appearances to them. But the thing to remember here, is there any rotation with it? Is there any debris getting picked up or anything like that? None of these are video. We have to kind of imagine it's just kind of hanging there. And we, sh we showed you the tornado footages. You can clearly see uh, violent rotation. And that's probably the key thing. Here's one from over in Lanesboro a few years ago. It has like a tornado funnel shape. This could have something to do with air coming up out of the valleys. You know, if it just rains, sometimes that cooler air, it, it tends to form clouds and fog a little easier. Um, another case of some videos here. And just see that they're kind of just hanging there. Yeah, it looks like maybe there's something kind of trying to rotate, but it just, if you're not sure, just keep an eye on it. So we're, we're and, and get another example, you have to be confident of these. Are you seeing that, that violent rotation? Uh, tornadoes will have that. So a lot of times it's just that clouds in. Even some of those little fingers that hang off those shelf clouds uh, that are approaching in too, you, you can call that, you know, there's some scud on the leading edge there. Um, sometimes we just get funnel after funnel cloud report on a squall line, and then we'll get a report from a train spotter that, you know, says, no, it's just people are seeing scud, I, I'm seeing no rotation. That really helps us kind of get reassured there. So, All right, all the things we talked about here tonight uh, are, are great during the daytime, but what do you do at night, right? Now, there is a distinct disadvantage at night. Uh, you're not gonna, there might not be as many of you out there, not gonna be able to see things as well. So we do have to put a little bit more weight on our radar data uh, because that's all we've got at night, but we still could use the background information as, as best we can. Some other dangers to think about at night. You can't see these features as well, so you gotta, you know, you, you could get caught off guard. If it's a true tornado case too, we don't want people in the path. So if you have any kind of radar support, you know, if the amateur radio clubs are running a net, is there someone telling that person, okay, this storm is, is tracking in this corridor, be careful. And um, like the shot in the, the bottom right there, that there is a tornado occurring. There's another shot of it with lightning strike behind it. So it kind of depends on, uh, you know, your visibility. There are some things that can help you. Lightning, I just showed you an example, and transformers or power lines. Flashing. There must be something on the ground causing that to create that type of uh, flash or mark. So some things that can help you. Here's a little video from the day before we had our severe weather and hail here in La Crosse in 2011. This was the same storm system out in I Iowa, and you can see something going on here after dark. In some of these lightning flashes, you can actually see these vortices on the ground spinning here, right there. So big different ball game at night, but there might be ways to still report in. Maybe just even if it's just happening at your house out there. All right, I realize I'm running a little long, but let's kind of finish up here with again very important communication here. The getting the information onto us is is the key step, you know, and onto emergency management or you know getting it to us so we can get the warnings out and working with the media as our partners and stuff, trying to get everyone informed that there is severe weather coming. Now, different ways to communicate here. Uh, I would call the more the organized groups here tonight, like again, the fire department, law enforcement, and I really appreciate the fire department personnel taking the time. I know you guys do a lot of training as it is to come in and uh, get trained here on this. A lot of times you're going to be passing it through at the county level, uh, and correct me if I'm saying anything wrong, Keith, but our, our dispatch center, and then we get that passed on to us. So we, we talk a lot of times directly with them. On the amateur radio side, which I know the amateur radio community in La Crosse County has always been kind of our big backbone there. It's really helpful. Uh, we'll oftentimes collect it and then pass it on to us also directly at the office. Assuming we're on the air, which I apologize, we're not always where you need us at the time, but at least collecting it and, and passing it on to us. But if you're here from the general public tonight, which I know there always is, you can you know stay involved, of course. Uh, in some counties, you can call their sheriff's department. You can use an administrative number. Uh, if it's high-end, if you get, you know, a, a, an emergency, of course, you use 911. But 
A lot of places you can just call us directly too and we'll take the information. So again, on that yellow sheet that hopefully you take with you, we have our contact information on there. Um, you can uh, put those numbers right in your cell phone or have them with you so that you're always, uh, always ready to report anything. They're unlisted, meant to report severe weather or something that's going on that we could find useful if you're calling to figure out if you can go fishing on Sunday or you know, planning your daughter's wedding or something like that. Um, there's other phone numbers that we have out there. But we never get, only one day in my whole career was that I, we had too much information coming in, and that was June 27, 1998, those windstorm days, the, the day Goose Island got hit and up to the north were getting hit. And we were getting so many reports of trees down everywhere that it was overloading us at the time. But that's one time in how many years and stuff. So it's, uh, we always like hearing from spotters. So a couple newer things, again, all this information is on that yellow sheet, but we have an online uh, way to submit information. You can go on there, either your mobile device or on your PC, and tell us what you're reporting, any details. It, it grabs your location if you're mobile, or you can put your location in and you answer a few questions and we get the report. It comes right into our system. We confirm it, and then we can be added as one of those storm reports. There's also an app called MPing. It's primarily, I think it works best in precipitation type issues, like ice and rain versus snow and stuff. But uh, it is out there on the Android and iOS systems. And what it looks like is the front screen comes up like this. It knows your location if you got your phone on, you know, and the GPS. You can pick any of these severe weather parameters, like hail. And then it comes up with the different sizes on here, too. And then we get a, a little message or a marker at our office, too, that that has come in. The one thing I want to urge you here is we don't really want to use this for tornadoes. Um, we'd rather hear from the person or get that more confirmed. Uh, everyone can get this app, and, and we don't want to, you know, someone that's playing around with us and is putting stuff in, tornadoes and stuff. We got to be a little careful with the information that's in there, so we, we kind of stay away from the tornado reports on that. So. As far as what to report, again, outlined on that yellow sheet, the basics, tornadoes, funnel clouds, rotating wall clouds. But we do like to know about flooding, as I mentioned. If you have a rain gauge, you get over an inch of rain, that you know helps us. I know in the morning we're going to be, I think Nicole has to be at work at 6, right? She's going to be collecting rain reports and you know needs to know the bigger rainfall totals and stuff. The higher end stuff like injuries, damage, I'm usually working with emergency management or sheriff's department and trying to get those, those details worked out. How to report? Hopefully your trustee is our, our gentleman here, but <coughs> who you are, when did it occur, is it occurring now? Try to use proper terms like stay away from those vague phrases like marble size hail, strong winds. Um, you can say how confident you are, whatever you feel comfortable on, but uh, give us those, that piece of information. And then as far as you know, where you report to, exact addresses, like this is the address of our office here in town, doesn't really help us. We, we don't know everyone's addresses or we don't have those details. So for this, the, the proper is we oftentimes will identify two miles east of La Crosse. Or, you know, instead of some, some little county road, I'm three miles northwest of West Salem and getting large hail or something like that. So referencing a, a, a well-known location is, is much easier for us. So. Realize, too, that the information we get is always used, but realize we also get information from a variety of sources. And so it's kind of like a, a, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, if it doesn't fit what we're expecting, we might ask for follow-up questions from you. Don't feel offended. If, if it appears we didn't use your report, don't, don't think that. I mean, it, we get a lot of information in. This is all the stuff that goes into making a, a warning decision. Yes, radar and spotters are the two main things, but we're also looking at the observations out there, history of it, lightning activity, radar, all the meteorology part of it. So it's not just as simple as Joe called in a tornado, we're going tornado. we got to kind of see if it all fits the puzzle out there. What's our meteorology set up, the environment, what is the media hearing, you know, we work, we work with all the groups, so there's a lot that goes into it. Social media, uh, again, if you want to, uh, you can mention us on Twitter, we have ways to kind of filter that or our hashtag. Uh, Facebook, we may not be able to always see it right away, maybe after the storm if you've got something to show or damage reports, um, we try to go back and look at that, but that's, you know, Facebook kind of jumps around 
from screen to screen or from story to story, so it's not always easy to see. But Twitter is a really good way to, to, to message us or, or tag us, if you will. All right, a few slides and we'll get you out of here. Uh, safety, again, don't get yourself in an uncomfortable position. Uh, never put yourself at a, at a huge risk if you don't feel comfortable out there. As a spotter, too, you have to obey all the rules. You don't get the right just as a spotter to uh, hang out in the median somewhere or something like that. You've got to stay out of the flow of traffic and, and not cause public officials any, any uh, harm out there. Uh, a few things to think about. You know, hail is a, is a possibility. Trees falling, so you've got to be careful parking your power lines and the trees falling. Lightning strikes. And, of course, the flooding. You gotta watch at night. You come across a flooded road like this, please don't drive through it. Treat it as a wall of fire or something like that. that okay, I gotta find an alternative route. Again, the lightning strikes out there. Um, once the storm is in your area, be very cautious of that and careful of it. So, but this example where you're driving along and thunderstorm wind damage has occurred. So probably preparing yourself for wind. How about this funky looking cloud? No. Nothing. Right, nothing. So watch it. It's just a scud cloud. Um, nothing to be really concerned with. Just see what it's doing. How about this one? Kind of a raggedy looking line here coming in. Again, another shelf cloud example. Not as clear cut, but probably going to have some strong winds. Maybe not severe, but strong winds coming at us. How about this one? Now you're towards the, the back part of the storm. Watch the rotation. Exactly. Watch for rotation. That's probably the best way to say it. It looks like you got a wall cloud. Watch for rotation there. And of course, report it if you see it. But it's. Uh... How about this? What would you report here? I see debris on the tornado. Yeah. Look at the horizon. If you look closely, there is debris. But a funnel cloud at least, but yeah, a tornado. There's, there's actually a tornado there. And uh, another shell cloud. But look at all the raggedy little fingers hanging down. This is just a line of wind coming in. Uh, I mean, could be a spin-up tornado in there somewhere, but you're not going to really be able to see it. But these are not little funnels. Just a shell cloud coming at you. Oh, oh I apologize. Let me move off of that. So <laughs> we, we do appreciate snow and road reports, you know, in the winter, but uh, we've had too much of it to, to count you on that. So, uh, Severe Weather Awareness Week is, uh, usually we have it around Severe Weather Awareness Week, but this year it's uh, about a month away now. Uh, Thursday, April 11th will be the day we're shooting for in Minnesota and Wisconsin for our tornado drill. Of course, we'll see what the weather is like at that time. I was a little bit earlier, but you'll hear more about that. By the way, if you've signed up tonight or are in our activation system, we will test that on the tornado drill day during the afternoon drill, uh, if we don't get to it before then, if we don't have any severe weather. But you should at least get a, a text message or an email on that day. Are you going to do the evening one too? Yeah, we will. It's an evening one. It is an evening drill and a daytime drill, but we only test the activation for the daytime drill. So yes, thanks for clarifying that. We do appreciate video or pictures if you have examples, not only for our own research of what happened with the storm, but uh, for storm, uh, sorry, storm spotting classes like this, you can see how we like to, to use the, the local information here. And in kind of closing then, again, don't, don't forget why we're here tonight. Uh, as a spotter, you may never get to a case where we end up with this higher end type of weather, and that's great. But your information is very valuable. Uh, we can't do this without you. That's my plea every year. I uh, really appreciate everyone going through the, the training, but then the, uh, you know, sometimes hours during the summer going out and, and doing this kind of volunteer work for your community, uh, for us at the Weather Service, uh, it, it's very valuable information and it always helps in 
better understanding of what is out there for our warnings and making it more accurate, things like that. So again, I can't thank you enough for that time and, and effort you put into it. That's all I have. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Mayo Clinic and the, the health system here for allowing us to use this room. I don't know if there's anyone in the room, but uh, they're nice enough to donate this space uh, you know, one night a, a year for us. I really appreciate that. Um, thanks to Keith Butler again, La Crosse County Emergency Management. And we've got some materials in the back there. Thank you, Molly and Nicole, for the long day and sticking with me. All right, I'll be up here to answer any questions if you want to. Otherwise, thank you. I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but appreciate it. By the way, if you uh, anyone want to be interested in amateur radio club information too, there's several of folks front and back of the room that can, can help you out there. Did you have anything else, Bill? Huh? Gus Nega. Uh, oh, I'm going to bring it.